Welcome to Mission Majima. Ajahn. Ajahn. So tell us about Majima Nikai number 10, the Satipatthana Sutta. So it's a big one um, <laughs> in the sense of how uh, much gravitas it has, how prime primary it is in our tradition and in people's practices. It's such a key sutta. Um, in it, the Buddha speaks about the Satipatthana, the establishings of mindfulness as its uh, one etymology kind of defines it as, although foundations of mindfulness is another etymology you'll hear, um, as the Ekayano Mago, uh, so the direct path to realization is one translation of that. And um, basically, uh, the Buddha singles these four foundations or establishings um, out as the domain of a practitioner in, in several other suttas. And he divides them into four kind of categories. Uh, a bhikkhu or a practitioner abides um, observing the body in the body or as uh, the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, uh, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. And the foundation of the body, um, the Buddha then goes into these uh, different ways of uh, establishing that foundation, namely uh, the breathing uh, and sort of breathing meditation, uh, postures, movements or sampajanya, sort of uh, situational awareness, the 32 parts of the body, the four elements, and the charnel ground contemplations. So that's the first foundation. The next is Vedana, uh, so feelings and uh, the mindfulness of feelings foundation. And that's looking at the feeling tone of experience, pleasant, painful, neutral, both in a worldly and a spiritual sense, which is a fascinating distinction we can get into. The third foundation is uh, that a practitioner abides observing the mind in and of itself. So mental states, the mind is constricted, distracted, um, contracted, and then on through uh, expanded and liberated and so on. And the final is the fourth foundation of dhammas, which is defined in some places as dhamma categories. So overlaying dhamma frameworks onto our experience. And, you know, the quality of sati, um, I've heard mindfulness often as connecting our experience to a framework and ways in the world we so often connect experience to the framework of self this is the Buddha giving us these four other really uh, spectacular or really powerful frameworks to look at our experience with. And he then ends with a prophecy that if one practices these sincerely for um, a year or seven years, a year and so on down to seven days, that one could expect the fruit of non-return or arhantship. So that's quite a, quite a thing to aim for. Mm. What would you like to draw out of this, Ajahn, in terms of highlights? Well, I would like to recommend a book, Satipatthana, by Bhante Analyo, where he goes into, he's got two books, basically, on this sutta. The first book, Satipatthana, Direct Path to Realization, um, goes into the ways that different modern and ancient traditions held this discourse. It really is, um, along with the Anapanasati Sutta, um, this sutta is probably the most direct uh, elaboration of what to do in meditation. So what Bhante Analyo does is, yeah, look at how different modern teachers and these ancient teachers would, would talk about each of these foundations of mindfulness. And you notice that, say, there are quotes from Ajahn Chah and other Thai forest teachers who really emphasize the first foundation of mindfulness mm -hmm. of knowing the body in and of itself thus teaching different ways of doing breath meditation, focusing on postures and this situational awareness, sampajanya throughout the day. You've got teachers like Goenkaji uh, teaching a the second foundation of mindfulness, knowing feelings in and of themselves mm. as the path, whether that's uh, dukkha, sukha, or mm. neutral. Um, then you've got teachings like whole schools of Buddhism. You could Someone could argue, I think, well, that... Zen or Chan, Chinese Chan, or Dzogchen, Tibetan Dzogchen, mind, are really based on the third foundation of mindfulness, knowing mind as mind in and of itself. And yeah, the way of looking at Dhammas is really an overlay which a lot of different teachers use. So I find that quite fascinating. And yeah, I have faith that teachers in each of these lineages have probably attained awakening even within our uh, our lifetime, or at least in our, our era. Hmm. 
um, last hundred years or so, and that each of them would teach their own way. And many of them do teach, you know, saying that this is the only way. Whereas uh, Bhante and Alia's book really draws it out that, oh, maybe there are these other mm. approaches and that these teachers just teach from what has worked for them. Mm. So that's great. Ajahn, I'm curious if you either wanted to draw out anything in particular or just to talk about how you found the sutta useful in your life. I think one uh, thing to focus in on is the fourth foundation of dhammas, um, dhamma categories. Um, in the Satipatthana Sutta, you'll see a, a variety of frameworks the Buddha lays out, including the six uh, sense bases, the five aggregates. Um, I do find it useful, although it's great to have that whole spectrum, to know that comparative studies um, really point to a core of the five hindrances and the seven factors of awakening. So just this dichotomy of positive and mental uh, and negative mental qualities. And for me, that really simplifies that, that fourth foundation. You know, and the other thing is I find the specifics of the sutta to be where the real power is and the uh, foundation of feeling uh, and mindfulness of feelings is really interesting because the Buddha lays out pleasant, painful, and neutral feelings uh, worldly, uh, samisa, and that's, you know, impact with the world in pleasant and painful ways or neutral. But he also points to pleasant, painful, and neutral spiritual feelings, uh, niramisa, and those are fascinating where, uh, in, I believe in the commentaries, it defines pleasant spiritual feeling as, you know, this happiness from loving kindness, um, from good sila, morality, a, ple a painful spiritual feeling as a uh, desire to attain one's goals and wholesome regret, and neutral as equipoise, equanimity, upekka. And just understanding that a lot of practice is replacing those worldly feelings with these spiritual ones. And, you know, you can't just give up pleasure, but can you replace worldly pleasure with these spiritual forms of pleasure. And yeah, that, I just love that distinction that you find here. So mm. and how about you, Ajahn? What, uh, how have you kind of applied this sutta in your day-to-day -day life? Yeah, I, I'm really grateful for our teachers and the Thai forest tradition really to bring things back to the body. It is possible for someone who's gotten, say, a Western type of, you know, a lot of education, a lot of reading to be very up in our heads. Mm. And then for these teachers, many of whom, you know, a generation ago, um, you say Ajahn Chah, uh, many of the teachers of the Thai forest tradition had very little formal education, but they were very embodied and could teach from that mm. place. And I think it's really helpful um, to come back to these practices of knowing the breath, whether it's a long breath or a short breath, knowing it as a long breath or a short breath, being able to breathe into the whole body. We'll go in more into that in Majima 118. It might be a year or so, but a um, couple years. But um, yeah, that's really helpful in knowing the different postures. The aspect of knowing mind as mind and where the Buddha points out that one knows a mind with lust is a mind with lust. A mind without lust is a mind without lust. One knows a mind with hatred, a mind with delusion, a scattered mind, a constricted mind, mm. an unliberated mind, a mind which hasn't gone beyond as all of these as they are. This is a hateful mind. This is a mm. deluded mind. And I find that really optimistic, actually, mm. that even noticing, oh, I'm feeling quite deluded right now, or I'm feeling quite, there's anger mm. or aversion of some kind. It's really helpful that I can start right there. Just that acknowledgement, I'm on, mm. that's an acknowledgement of I'm within this frame of references, Ajahn Jeff's translation of foundation of mindfulness, which is shifted out of the frame, which is just totally you know, being warped and unconsciously deluded by delusion into a framework of, oh, there is delusion here, but that's not the whole of the story. The mind is hmm. bigger than that. So I think worth pointing or singling out there is um, with the mental states, the kind of negative mental qualities that the Buddha points to at first, um, the phrasing is one knows a mind with um, distraction as with distraction and so on. And so this like subtle distinction between the, men, the, the mind itself and the negative mental state is experienced, it, it kind of points to what you're, you're singling out, which is this, 
you know, refuge in, in the knowing to some extent. So thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. So Ajahn, what is the word of the week? The word of the week, can you guess? It's sati. And that comes from the root sar, which means to remember. Um, it means mindfulness. Um, although I kind of love the translation recollectedness, recollect. And it speaks to that aspect of mindfulness. So mm. hoping people are able to keep that in mind this coming week. Let's do it. Yeah, because those who are tuning in for the first time can zoom, zoom in in a minute uh, to our meeting. And then we'll see you again next week after your full mindfulness week and for our next sutta, Majima number 11. Thanks, Ajahn. Okay. Okay.